Welcome to Monday Night Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown, and I've got Steve Kokoska and Tom Dick here uh, with me this evening. I am super excited to uh, have them here. We are going to be talking a little bit about polar curves tonight. I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, favorite things. But no, Steve, I did not do my homework. So oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay? All right, ask okay. me some questions, but I'll be looking to the uh, the chat box for a little bit of help. Uh, just a couple of things. I did post the uh, teacher doc, or sorry, the student document uh, down in the description earlier uh, last week. I guess a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, so you should have access to the student questions that we're going to be going through tonight, and then tomorrow we will. Uh, update that description with uh, the teacher document and all the solutions as well. Um, otherwise, I will uh, let you guys get started. All right. Thank you, Curtis. We're trying a little new technology tonight. So, oh, you're going to let me share my screen again. Sorry. Oh, about that's that. right. But one of these days, I'm going to remember how to, uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, that you can you can do that on, on your own here. Uh, there we go. Let's see. Did that do it? Yes, sir. Terrific. All right. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. All right. Can you see that, Curtis? I can. All right. Very good. So we're using a little bit of new technology tonight. We'll see if this works. Um, once again, what we've been posting on the Facebook page and on the website are a series of problems. The problems tonight deal with uh, polar equations, polar curves, and the calculus surrounding uh, polar curves. And I can't forget to say a special hello to our uh, AP students in Canada tonight. I know there's a couple of them watching up there. So the test is coming up. We hope that they'll do well too on that exam. So the first one tonight, Curtis, has a polar equation, r equal three sine of three theta. And we want to find an equation of all the tangent lines to the graph at the origin. So as you look at this graph, and this is a complete graph that I've got here, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but we can actually get a complete graph here for theta between zero and pi. And it sure looks like uh, this graph passes through the origin a couple of times. So there might be a couple of tangent lines that we're looking for here. So what's going on at the origin at that point, r is equal to zero. And so my first approach here was well, I'm going to set r equal to zero, and I'm going to see if I can solve this for theta. So I thought about, well, okay, uh, when is the sign of this argument zero? Well, when the argument is zero, when the argument is pi, when the argument is two pi, and actually when the argument is three pi, but I'll just start right over here. If I solve that, I get theta equal to pi, and I'm back where I started. So I'm not going to worry about that one. And although I'm going to solve this again on the next page, I'm going to have a theta equals zero. If I'm doing this right, I've got a theta equal to pi over three and a theta equal to two pi over three. So I've got three values of theta that correspond to points at the origin or at the pole. And we need to find the equation of the tangent line at those three values, those three points. So how do we do that? How do we, first of all, find the slope of that tangent line? Well, I probably should have put a line in here. We're going to use the method for finding the slope of this curve defined by parametric equation. So we think about theta as actually a parameter here, and we write the parametric equations that describe this curve. And here they are in general. And so the slope at any point, dy dx would be dy d theta divided by dx d theta. First question for you, Curtis. How do I find dy d theta? Where did that come from? What's the general idea? What's the general concept in order to find dy d theta? And I'll give you a little hint. There's y right there. How do I do that again? How do I find dy d theta and then again dx d theta in the de denominator? Oh, man, you got me on the spot tonight. I'm tired, Steve. Oh, all right, I'm deeply <laughs> sorry. Well, we're going to have to use the product rule. I was going to say product rule, but... Both of, the, both of those expressions are function of, functions of theta, and so I've got to use the product rule. So this is sort of the general expression 
So the slope of a point on the curve. And what I'm going to do is to apply this now to see exactly what's going on when I'm at the origin. So this is a little cumbersome, Curtis, but I'm going to give it a try. Here I go to page two. What's going on with the tangent line at the pole? Well, at the pole, r is equal to zero. So if I plug zero in here into that expression from the previous page, there was an r right here and an r right here. So those two terms are going to drop. And now, so long as the r d theta is not zero and the cosine of theta is not zero, I can do a little simplification and I end up with the tangent of theta. So at the pole, in general, the slope of the tangent line is the tangent of theta. So armed with that information, I'm going to take these values right here. I don't need to worry about pi. And I'm going to plug them in to this expression right here, dx theta, dy dx, excuse me, is equal to the tangent of theta. And I'll find here that, let's see, the slope is zero. Well, that's pretty easy. The tangent line then would be zero. Here, the tangent of pi over three is the square root of three. Ah, wait a minute, I'm a little confused here. Um, there doesn't seem to be, you know, this y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. How come? Why is this just y is equal to the square root of 3x, the slope times x? Any luck on that one, Curtis? Why is it that it's the slope? Why, why is that the equation of the tangent line? Why don't I have to worry about a value of x and a value of y? Now, notice that these equations are given in Cartesian coordinates in x's and y's. Why don't I have to worry about, you know, sort of this general equation of y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1? It seems like I've left something out there. What's going on? Here? Well, you're hitting the origin. Very good. And so That's an important the, uh, distinction. And therefore, what's the value of y1 and x1? Uh, zero. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I don't need to worry about that. And similarly, at theta equal to 2 pi over 3. Wow. The slope is right here, and there's the equation of the tangent line. I love that we're getting some help in the uh, chat here tonight. Are they helping you again, Curtis? Chief? No, I got that one on my own. All right, okay. Well, you know me, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I mean, they were helpful. They were, <laughs> but I got it on my own. On that well, I'm not satisfied without a drawing, just to sort of back this up. And so at the top of this page, here once again is a graph of that polar equation. And it's kind of hard to see my tangent line, y equals zero, but it's in there. And there are the two other tangent lines. And you can kind of see that they are indeed tangent to the curve at the pole. And another question that we might ask here is, well, what are the polar equations for those tangent lines? And I wrote them down here. Uh, a good exercise or a good reminder here is, that if we write yeah. theta equal to a constant, that is actually an equation of a line mm -hmm. through the origin. So that's kind of cool. That's a good, that's a good. I like that one. That's a good one to like start that. out with. Let's see if we can try this one. So let's consider the graph of this cardioid, which is described by this polar equation, r equal one minus sine theta. And I'm going to do a couple of things here. The first is I want to find the slope of the tangent line to this cardioid when theta is equal to 2 pi over 3. And then I'd like to see if I can find all the points on this cardioid where the tangent line is either horizontal or vertical. So what I've done is I provided you a picture of this cardioid. And, you know, we used to talk a lot more about this. Tom will remember better than me. But we used to talk a lot more about this idea of doing exploration first and then going to either the calculator or our theoretical work with a piece of paper and a pencil and then back to maybe the technology for confirmation. So if you just think a little bit about ex uh, exploration here, you can kind of envision, and you might be able to draw in where some of these horizontal tangent lines are, where some of these vertical tangent lines are. I challenge you to think about where is the point on this cardioid where theta is equal to 2 pi over 3. So think about that one while I start the solution down at the bottom. 
So the very first thing I need to do is to find a general expression for the slope at any point on this curve. And so I set out to find dy dx, and I went back and I know that dy dx is dy d theta divided by dx d theta. And these are sort of the general expressions right here. And then what I did was I plugged in the actual values or the actual expressions. Let me just write a little bit off to the side if I can here. We have r is equal to one minus the sine of theta. And so, okay, if we want r prime or dr d theta, we take the derivative of the right-hand side and we've just got minus the cosine of theta. So armed with that information, I tried to plug in all these values. Here are my r's. Here's a dr d theta. And then the next few steps here, Curtis, are just a lot of simplification, a couple of trig identities, which I know you did because I know you're, you're uh, very conscientious about your homework mm -hmm. here. I did. What I did in a final step here, thinking ahead, you might not do this and that's okay, but I'm looking ahead a little bit. And what I tried to do is completely factor both the numerator and the denominator. And I think that's going to be useful for me here as I attack, I think, part B. So there's my expression for dy dx for any value of theta. Let me see if I can go to the next page. So now, I want to evaluate dy dx at theta equal to two pi over three. And so looks kind of awful here, looks messy, but as I plug in theta equal to two pi over three and do a lot of simplification, can you believe it? After all of that, I get a minus one. So the slope of the tangent line to this polar curve when theta is equal to two pi over three, is actually equal to minus one. I'm gonna scribble just a little bit on this graph. Here's a graph of the cardioid. And I think the point on the cardioid is around there. And there's the tangent line with a slope of minus one. And I'm gonna issue a challenge out there. I did not do this, but here's something that you can think about. Can you get an equation? Of this tangent line? How would you go about doing that? I don't think, I do not believe that this tangent line goes through the pole or through the origin. It's pretty close there, but I don't think it does. So you might think about how do you get that equation? All right, well, let's attack part B. This is, a, this is an interesting problem, I think. And Tom and I might argue a little bit about this, Curtis. We may need a referee. Okay. So we need to find places where the tangent line is horizontal or where the tangent line is vertical. Let me draw a little line in here. And so what I need to do is to take a look at where that numerator is zero. Where the numerator is zero and where the denominator is non-zero, then the slope of the tangent line would be zero, and therefore I would have a horizontal tangent line. So now you can probably see the benefit a factoring completely. So here's my expression for dy d theta, the numerator in that expression, factored completely. And now by the principle of zero products, <coughs> excuse me, I have to find out where is the cosine of theta equal to zero, where is this expression equal to zero, or equivalently, where is the sine equal to one half? And don't let me make a mistake on this one, Curtis. I got two values of theta over here, two values of theta over here. I'm going to circle this value of pi over two because I'm thinking about what's coming here, what's ahead. That's going to be a little problematic. It sure looks like initially that there are four places where the tangent line is horizontal. Let's take a look at where the tangent line is vertical. Well, that would occur where the denominator is zero and where the numerator is non-zero. So I'm going to go back and look at this completely factored expression. Again, the principle of zero products. So let's see where the first expression is zero or where the sine of theta is equal to minus one half. I think that gives me two values of theta over here. 
where the second expression is equal to zero, that gives me, uh-oh, this one value of theta equal to pi over two. So that's a value of theta where both the numerator and the denominator are equal to zero. So let's hold that theta equal to pi over two in abeyance. I'm not sure exactly yet what's going on there, but let's handle the more straightforward cases here. So where do I have horizontal tangent lines? Well, when theta is equal to three pi over two, pi over six and five pi over six, there they are. How did I get these values of R? Well, I went back to the original expression and plugged in those values of theta. And you know, Curtis here, that eventually I'm gonna draw a picture of all of this. How do I find where the vertical tangent lines occur? Well, I take these values of theta, plug them into the original expression, get my values of R. Here's where we have horizontal tangents. Here's where we have vertical tangents. And now what the devil do we do with theta is equal to pi over two. Any ideas on that one, Curtis? What do we do? How do we resolve this? How do you resolve the pi over two one? Yeah, what do we do there? I mean, I, I'm lean, I'm I was just about to type in that about the um, the visualization, just trying to visualize that and watching it go around and being able to kind of think about it in my head. Well, about that's a good way to explore where it. each one of those uh, radius radii <laughs> should, uh, are, well, the angle anyway, uh, should be reaching. And so I'm just thinking about that. I've also <laughs> got uh, somebody putting in the chat right now, Lopital. Oh, uh, I like that. I, I hadn't like thought that of that. So Crystal, thank you for that. I like that good suggestion. Point. How about that? So at theta equal to pi over two, both dx d theta and dy d theta are zero. So we have an indeterminate form if we were taking a look at a limit as x goes to theta, pardon me, as x theta goes to pi over two. So let's use L'Hopital's rule, excellent suggestion. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take a look at two one-sided limits. So see if I can get this here. I'm going to take a look at first the limit as theta goes to pi over two from the left of dy dx. And it was in completely factored form. And I was a little judicious in the way that I, I grouped terms here. Because this limit, I believe I can actually evaluate. And that turns out to be a minus one third. This one right here still gives me this zero over zero. That's the source of this zero over zero. So I can now apply L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. The derivative of the denominator is cosine. And let's see, did I do this right? As theta goes to pi over two from the left-hand side, the numerator is going to minus one. What's the denominator doing? Well, that's getting closer and closer to zero. But remember this notation from a couple of sessions ago, that's getting closer and closer to zero positively. So let's see if I can put this all together. If that's true, then this expression is getting very, very large negative, decreasing without bound, times a negative one third, which makes the product increasing without bound, going to plus infinity. What the heck does that tell me? Well, that seems to suggest that the slope of the tangent line is going towards infinity. What does that suggest, Curtis, about the nature of that tangent line? That it's vertical. That it is vertical. Excellent. All right. Did so I say that out loud? <laughs> that, was, that was very good. That was, I don't mean to sound surprised. That was very good. Very good. <laughs> very good. So now let's take a look at the limit as x goes to pi over two from the right-hand side. There is a little plus sign in there. And I won't go through this in gory detail, but you can probably see from some of these expressions up here that what will change was, uh, will be that I will get be going to zero through small negative values, and that will drive this limit to minus infinity. All right, Curtis, I'm gonna do my best to lead you into this one, okay? So what does this limit suggest about the tangent line? 
as we get closer and closer to pi over two from the left. Well, that it's also vertical. I agree with that. So these two expressions together tell me that indeed I have a vertical tangent line when theta is equal to pi over two. Now, there are some textbooks that will argue that because these limits are different, where this is negative and this one's positive, they will argue that the tangent line is not vertical. And I don't know what, what the alternative is here. But I think, seriously, Curtis, I think your explanation, your intuitive explanation of what's going on with that tangent line is a good one. As I approach theta, uh, theta equal to pi over two from both directions, the tangent line is getting more and more and more vertical right. from both directions. Right. And therefore, I have a vertical tangent line at that point. So here's my picture to try to back all of that up. And let's see, if you can see all of that on the screen, Curtis, I think I've got a horizontal tangent line there, one there and one there. We had two vertical tangent lines that were pretty easy, one there and one there. And where's pi over two? It's right there. And I think I've got a vertical tangent line in there. So that's a good one. I hope some people solved that one and were ready for that. I think that's a nice question, which you can try tomorrow morning with your class. Uh, good review question. That is a really nice question. Now, I've got some other calculus problems that I want to look at. We want to look at an area problem in a minute if we have time. We want to, oops, we want to look at, oops, I'm sorry, Chris. We want to look at a uh, an arc length problem in a minute. But one thing that is an issue for us when we're drawing polar graphs, at least for me anyway, is how do I know that I have a complete graph? What's my interval for theta? Does it go theta equal to zero to pi? Is it zero to 12 pi? How do you know? So one of the questions that I asked here that we put out there on Facebook and on the website was try to get complete graphs for these equations. So I'm gonna scribble a little bit on part A, Curtis, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Tom. We'll talk a little bit about graphing some of these. So I believe that a complete graph, whoops, I'm sorry. I believe that a complete graph, how do we get out of there? Son of, oh, there we go. I believe a complete graph of this expression is shown on your screen. It's kind of like a flower with petals, but it's outlined around the end, which is kind of cool. And how do you know how to let theta vary? What's the interval which gives you this complete graph? Well, Here's not a very theoretical way to do it, but here is a way to do it. So I'm going to look at 2.5 theta. I'm going to look at that argument, and I'm going to add 2.5 theta times 2n pi. And I'm going to think about this expression right here. And another way to write that, of course, would be 5 halves times 2n pi. And what I need to do here is I need to find a value of n so that this product is an even multiple of pi. So like 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi. Once I find that value of n, then this part of the expression is my upper bound on theta. Now that seems like a long way to go, and Tom will probably have a better way of explaining this but I think this works. So for example, in this case, if I let n equal to two, that will cancel with this two and I'll get a 10 pi out of there, which is an even multiple of pi. And so that says my two times my n times pi, that says that I need to go theta equal to zero to four pi to get a complete graph. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know what you want to ask me. Why doesn't n equal to one work? Well, if n were equal to one, the twos would cancel and I'd get a five pi, which is an odd multiple of pi. And that violates my rule where I have to end up with an even multiple of pi. So I think zero to four pi gives me a complete graph. And Curtis, seriously, someone out there may have a better method, a more precise method, a more prescriptive method for doing this. I'm going to turn it over to Tom if I can. 
and he's going to do a little bit with calculate. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we'll give this a try and share my screen here. Sorry, I just tried it. Okay. And, and it did worked. you get it? I did. How about that? Beautiful. All right. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start out with the uh, TI-84. Right. There we go. Share my screen there and see if Got it. you guys give me some visual feedback if you're seeing any issues there. So I've opened up the 84 here on uh, the usual Y equals screen. Uh, but we're doing polar, uh, so just want to just kind of run through the basics here of how you do polar with the 84. I'm going to go to the mode menu, and that's where we can see uh, lots of different choices here, but that fifth line down where it says function, that's the thing that's uh, controlling what kind of our graphs we're looking at. So I'm going down to that line, and then I want to uh, arrow over to polar. Hit enter. And then if we go back to our Y equals screen, we should see a very different looking menu here of, or list of, of functions here. So these are uh, R's. They're numbered one through six, but each one of those is an R equal. And it's expecting a function of theta. And just a reminder here, uh, this key that has the X comma T comma theta comma N, that um, what that key activates is your independent variable, and it depends on what mode you're in. When we're in polar mode, that's going to work as a theta key for us. Um, so uh, let me try just for a simple one. Uh, let me try this uh, one minus sine of theta that uh, Steve did in uh, problem two. So I'm just going to do one minus the sine of theta. And I'm just hitting that independent variable key and it should bring up a theta for us. There we go. Looks good. And now before I graph this, I want to go to the window just to see kind of what we've got available there to us for setting our up our window here. And besides the usual things that we're used to, the x min, x max, x scale that sets up the, uh, the dimensions of our window, uh, because theta's parameter, we also have settings for that. And these, uh, the settings that you're seeing here are the default. So theta min is zero, theta max 6.28 something. Uh, that looks familiar. I think that must be two pi. Uh, but this theta step is kind of a weird uh, looking thing here. So you're point one three something other. Uh, you can set that theta step to whatever you want. Uh, keep that in mind at 0 0.1308. I'm going to pick a uh, step size for theta that's going to hit all of our usual um, rational multiples of theta or pi that we're used to uh, thinking about when we're graphing by hand. So this would be like pi over four, pi over six, pi over three. Uh, so what I'm going to choose here is pi divided by. 24. So that's going to hit all these values, uh, the ones we're used to, as well, as well as some additional ones. So that's a nice step size for theta. And surprise, surprise, when I hit enter, oh, that was the default value. So you can see they chose a default value there that's pretty nice for polar. Okay, well, let's look, take a look at this graph and see what we get. <clears throat> And there's that cardioid, just like what Steve had before. Um, okay, so uh, we can do um, other graphs. Let's see, let's go back to the y equals. I'm gonna clear this one out and actually try the one that Steve was looking at most recently. Let's see, I think that was the sine of uh, 2.5. Right times theta. And it's that entire thing cubed. 
And then let me arrow over and then we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll add the cosine of 2.5 times theta cubed. I should say uh, cosine of 2.5 theta, that whole quantity cubed. So. so make sure I get uh, my light parentheses and cube that. And I'm just going to go ahead and graph this, see what we get. Well, now that looks funky. <laughs> um, boy, what did I do wrong? Well, you might remember Steve had a, a my, my theta min theta max was just zero to two pi. That's the default. But Steve used a different uh, value. I think, well, let's see, did you go up to what, 10 pi, Steve? Or if, pi it's, pi? if it's four. part A with the 2.5 theta, I went zero to four pi on this zero one. Zero to four pi. Okay, right. I was thinking of another part of the problem here. So let's go back to the window. And I'm going to do a couple of different things here. Uh, let's see. Let me change my theta max to four times pi. And the other thing I'm going to do is, uh, well, actually, let me go ahead and graph that, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and just zoom in. Oh, okay, that's looking more Boy. complete. That's a pretty tiny picture there. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in right there at the origin. Wow. Now you might be looking at that and saying, well, that looks uh, kind of jagged here. Okay. Uh, well, that's because uh, that theta step, this, uh, this function is, this polar function is really changing our values pretty quickly. It's kind of uh, veering in and out from the origin uh, pretty quickly. And so we can uh, go back to our window and I'm gonna to go to the theta step and make that finer. Let's make that instead of pi over 24. Whoops, I hit the wrong one, sorry. Let me see, my X min I think was negative 1.65. Yes, I think so, Tom. Sorry, I just got on the wrong line there. So there's theta step. Let's make that pi. How about, uh, let's make it instead of pi over 24, let me make it pi over uh, 72. And that should be hopefully a finer, uh, smoother graph, I should say. Uh, I'm liking the way this is looking a lot better. Okay, now that's looking that? a lot more like the, the graph Steve had, so. How about that? Um, Couple of other things to point out when you do a trace, uh, you're gonna get um, identification of the function that you were, the polar function that you're plotting. But look down here at the trace values, we actually have uh, three different trace values. There's one for theta giving us that angle. And it's also giving us the X and Y coordinates. And when I hit the right arrow key, it's going to be incrementing by theta, uh, and then we use the theta step to do those increments. And let's see, I should be able to get out to, let me see if I can get to pi over four. And I think that's pretty close to it. Let's see. That, uh, does that make sense? Let's think about it. If theta was pi over four and you took two and a half times that, let's see, two and a half times pi over four. I may not be thinking correctly here. Let's see. I'm thinking what would be a good, I was thinking pi over four would be out at the extreme of this pebble. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 
2.5 times pi over four. Let's see, I think that's about hmm, five pi over eight. You need to keep you need to keep uh, going. Your theta is too small. You need to go about 0.78. Ah, uh, okay. Let's see. Right. So, go ahead. There we go. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I was guessing that this pedal was at about pi over four, but it really isn't. Okay. So, uh, that's a good question to think about: is what would be that extreme R value? Pi over five. Uh huh. And by the way, that's something we could do with calculus. Is Absolutely. If R is a function of theta, we could say, okay, what's the maximum value of R? And just do calculus right there. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a really neat thing, I think, with the uh, um, the um, trace feature here and being able to explore. By the way, this is really nice visual confirmation that we're at pi over four for theta. Look at my X and Y values there. They're equal. So the mm -hmm. beta equals pi over four line is, is the same as our Y equal X line. All right. Okay. So Tom, before you leave this, I have a question that we can ask uh, people who are listening. Would you go back just for one second, go back to the uh, window? Sure. There we go. So I'm looking at the theta step line. Mm -hmm. And somebody might be wondering, well, you know, he always took pi divided by some constant. Why can't I just set that to be something like 0.1 or 0 0.01? What's the harm in that? Or would that always work? Well, so maybe I, I we could... a, that's the kind of thing is, well, let's try it out and see what happens. Okay. So you said uh, point, Try point, point zero 0.05. How about that? Okay, I'll go with that. Try point zero 0.05. Now it may not. Whoops, let's see. I made a little typo there. Maybe doesn't matter. Oh, let's see. There we go. All right, point zero 0.05. Let's look and at let's see what happens. Yeah, it might not be evident in this uh, complex a graph, but, yeah. but but I think the other issue, and it may not be the issue you were looking at. So that point zero five was actually pretty close to the pi over seventy two, right? But the the I think the issue here is for certain polar graphs, this might not really matter much, but for ones that involve trigonometric functions, the thing is, if we go to the trace now. Uh, you'll see that when I start to use my right arrow key, the theta is going to increment by 0 0.05. Right. And the issue potentially is none of those theta values are really going to match up with any nice in, uh, rational multiples of pi that yep. we're used to thinking about. So yep. my only recourse to actually evaluating this is really the calculator, is calculating the actual value. Mm -hmm. Are there. And Tom, if you have the opportunity, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you would graph the w equation that's given in part F. Okay. And I'll tell you what I got for an interval that gives a complete graph. I just thought that was kind of a really cool one. Okay. Should I go ahead and do that right now? How about that? Okay. Sure. All right. So let me go back to the y equals. I'll clear out this one. And in part F, yes, that's an interesting one. It actually has an exponential in it. Indeed it does, yep. Okay, so we're gonna get the E to the sine of theta. Right. Okay. There we go. And then once we've got that, let me get uh, arrow down. Get out of the exponent there. Good. And it's minus two times the cosine right. of four theta. 
Correct. Now, I think, Tom, that this will produce a complete graph if you go from zero to two pi. From zero to two pi, okay. Let's try that anyway, and let's see what All happens. Right. So let's go back to my window. So you're saying four pi will be uh, overkill here. So let's- just I think so, I think so. So I'm gonna make that uh, two times pi for my theta max. And pick something reasonable for your theta step, you know, like a pi over 48 or 72 might be better. Okay. So pi over 72, you think? Might be, be good, yeah. Go up, uh, make sure you're on that, that okay. line. Yeah. Well, there you go. Find pi over 72. Yep, and this graph, if it works out, this might even have a name here. A name? Ah, will, the, will the calculator shout it out to me? That's I think so. I think it will. <laughs> okay. If it works. <laughs> I've got that special version here. Okay, okay, here we go. All right. All right, let's give it a shot. Oh, and you know, I'm still on that zoomed in version. So yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out. Okay. Uh, we'll just do a zoom out at the origin. Okay, here we go. Oh, interesting. All there right. There you go. And uh, that's pretty good. Oh, interesting. At theta equals zero. Yeah. It's starting over here to the left. Does that make sense? Well, I would want to look up here at this function. Yeah. Let's see when theta is zero, sine of zero is zero, and e to the zero is one. Mm -hmm. But the cosine of zero is one. So this will be at minus two times one. So I get a one minus two is negative one up. Oh. Makes perfect sense. That's why I'm that. at negative one zero. Perfect. I love that. Okay. And this is also showing that if your R value is negative, that's okay. It's going to be reflected through. So theta equals zero is corresponding to going out of the positive x axis. But if my R is negative, we just reflect through and it'll be backwards here on one. Okay. So let's just see how this thing traces. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so it's kind of swinging down on that small bottom loop. Oh, and now it's going on this larger loop. I think these R values are, let's see, what are these R values? Well, well we go ahead and get to uh, I over four again. Okay, and I get the x equals y, so that's pi over four. Okay, so here we really are getting a positive r value. I think that makes sense. If pi theta is pi over four, uh, four times pi over four is pi, the cosine of pi is negative one, negative two times negative one will be a positive two. So this is definitely gonna be positive. Yep. Okay. And just a little note here, this first term, this e to the sine of theta, that term will always be positive, right? Because uh -huh. yep. it's an exponential, okay? But this term over here, that negative two times cosine of four theta is going to fluctuate positive negative. And um, at times we can see it actually is larger than this value of e to the sine of theta. So Curtis, is a is a, the name of this curve screaming out at you? I mean, <laughs> the name of the curve. What what does it sort of look like? I mean, it looks like a butterfly. Beautiful, uh, excellent. How do you like that? I so, mean, does it scream out the name butterfly? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> we call it the butterfly effect. There you go. <laughs> oh man! Very Ooh. good. Tom. Very right. good. How about that? Okay. So um, I think I should probably stop the share and give it back to you, Steve, if that's okay. all right. Very okay. good. All right. Excellent. All right. Let's see if I can find this again. Where did this go? There it is. There we go. Good. Okay. 
So let's take a look at number four. Let's do a little, a couple more calculus problems here before we quit for tonight, Curtis. So we want to find the area enclosed by one loop of this polar curve described by this expression, r equal four cosine of three theta. Um, I've drawn a, a graph here, and there's one loop. Uh, you, you could actually use any loop you wanted here. This just says one of the loops, and there's a lot of symmetry here. They're all going to have the same area. And I'm going to use, I'm going to take advantage of some of the symmetry here. I believe that this top half here of this loop is traced out for zero to pi over six. I think this graph, if Tom were to draw this on his calculator and do a little bit of tracing, I think it starts over here and goes in this direction from zero to pi over six. It ends up right here at the origin. So remember that we're not really talking about the calculus concepts here. We're not going through that this evening. We're assuming that you remember some of those. So in order to find the area of that loop, here's what I did. A lot of little things going on here. Remember, we want to find a definite integral from alpha to beta or a to b of r squared, and there's got to be a one half in there, one half r squared. So here's my one half. Here's my r squared. And I'm going to put a two out in front because I'm really only finding the area of half of that loop, the top half. My bounds are zero to pi over six. So let's see, how do I do this one? Well, the twos will cancel, I'm happy with that. I square everything, I've got a 16, that'll come out in front. And how do I find an antiderivative there analytically? Well, I have to use the half angle formula. That's a pretty standard sort of, not substitution, but that's a pretty standard technique here when I have the sine or the cosine squared. So now I can take uh, the antiderivative of each term, term by term, is my expression. Oh, I brought that one half out in front, so now I've got an eight. There's my antiderivative. Plug in the bound, zero to pi over six. And I ended up with a four pi over three, which is kind of cool. So the exact area, I was always amazed at this, the exact area of that loop is four pi over three. I hope some of you got that. I hope some of you have worked on these problems or at least had your students work on some of these. I'm gonna show one calculator screen because you know, Curtis, I always find this absolutely remarkable. This is a screenshot from a TI Inspire CAS version. Wanda got it. Wanda got it, oh cool, very cool. And I'm still continuously amazed that these machines can return the exact symbolic answer. And so what I did here is in two lines, what I did here is I first defined this function r, and I have to think a little bit about, of course, what's the setup, what are the bounds, and I'm worried about finding just the top half, and I have to multiply by two. But look, here's my expression, just as I might write it with a piece of paper and a pencil, and the machine comes back with the exact symbolic answer, four pi over three. <laughs> That's just really cool, I think. That's, re that's remarkable. All right, let's try one more if we can here. So let's take a look at these two polar curves described by r equal the sine of two theta, r equal the cosine of two theta. I hope you can see some of the color in this picture on your screen, Curtis. The graphs are drawn in blue and green, and there is a little shaded area in there. And so the first thing I want to do is to find the area of the region that lies inside both curves. Well, there's actually a lot of these regions. I've shaded in one of them, but jeepers, there's a lot of them here. So there's a lot of symmetry as one would expect. So I'm gonna try to find the area of one of those regions and then multiply, is it by eight, I think? So let me arrow down just a little bit if I can and show you what I did here. I, I'm glad you can still see my picture. I had to think about this a little bit. Here's my eight, because I've got eight of these regions. Here's a two, because really I'm only finding the area of half of that region, a lot of symmetry here. There's the one half. And I believe 
from here out to here is zero to pi over eight. And this is the curve uh, sine of two theta, I believe. So there's the sine squared of two theta. I did a little simplification out here with the constants. There's I'm left with an eight. I'm going to use that half angle formula again, that same sort of, I hate using that word trick, but that same sort of idea. One half times the eight, there's the four. There's my antiderivative. Plug in the bounds. A little bit of simplification, and this seems almost impossible, but it's pi over two minus one. And I have to tell you, Curtis, so when I first saw that answer, I thought of two things. Number one, I thought, well, you know what? That can't be the answer because it looks like it's a negative value. But it's not negative because what's the value of pi over two? Well, it's approximately what? 1.57, is yeah. that correct? Yeah. So that's positive. That's one thing that sort of bothered me here. And the other thing that sort of bothered me is, well, you know, that's a small number. It's about 0.57. And I've got eight of these regions. So I've really blown up this curve quite a bit. The graph might be a little misleading, but that's the exact total area of all of those regions. Of all eight of them? All eight of them, which is yes. very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Right. So now the second part of this was find the area of the region that lies outside the graph of sine two. Well, I got that one too. She did. Oh, I don't know. Terrific. Very good. Very good. And inside the graph of R equal to the cosine of two theta. So the very first thing I had to do is to think about, well, where are these regions? And once again, what I did up at the top here was I drew one of them, shaded in one of them. Now, you might think, Curtis, that there's actually eight of them, but there aren't here. And the reason is because it says inside one of the graphs and outside the other one. So there's actually only four of these regions. And so you have to really think about which is the graph of the inside curve, what's the graph of the outside curve, and you'll see that there are really just four of these regions. So there's the four. Again, finding just half of it, so I'm multiplying by two. And once again, I'm going to go zero to pi over eight, which I think is going to give me uh, half of this region. Now, there's a lot going on inside here. Oh, by the way, how do I do all of this? How, how do I actually find this? You've got to think about finding a, a larger area and subtracting off a smaller area. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you think a little bit about that since we're running close to time. How do you do this one? There's a little bit going on here on the in that equal sign. Maybe you could throw that out there. How do you find an actual symbolic antiderivative of that? And I am just absolutely amazed that the answer here, believe it or not, is exactly one. How about that? And you can actually do this with technology. I defined my two functions over there on the left-hand side. And I found this definite integral over here is the second expression. It's exactly one. I believe this is the answer for part A. It doesn't look exactly like the way I wrote it on the previous page, but yep, that's pi over two minus one. And again, quite amazing that you can do all of that with technology and get the exact answer. That is pretty cool. Do I have time for one more? I do. Let's do one more calculus problem and I'll hand it over to Tom for maybe one more idea with technology. So one of the other things that we often ask students to do on the exam is to find the length of a curve. You can actually find the length of a polar curve. And so let's see if we can find the length of this cardioid described by one minus cosine of theta. So again, we're not going through the conceptual ideas here, but what I need to do is to find a definite integral, zero to two pi, that traces out this cardioid one complete time. And the formula here is, the integrand is the square root of r squared plus dr d theta squared. So I did all of that. Here's r squared. dr d theta, well, let's see. The derivative of that is what? Derivative of the cosine is minus the sine. So minus a minus, there's the sine squared. 
And I simplified that a little bit and got this expression. Here's a good question. Can you find a symbolic and analytic antiderivative of this? Can you do it by hand? My guess is that you can. Yeah, I think I have an idea how to do it, but that's a good question for those of, those of you who are watching. And believe it or not, the exact answer here is eight. So the length of that cardioid, one complete root around that cardioid has length eight. Eight units. How about that? Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you for maybe one last technology tip here. Uh, sure. Sounds okay. good. There okay. you go. Hey, I'm going to uh, actually share a TI Inspire screen. Um, you can see the emulator I've got here is a TI Inspire or it's TI Inspire CAST software, but this I think would work just fine on a non CAST machine. Uh, some of the early graphs that Steve was showing, uh, you might have noticed that he had them laid against. Uh, what I would call polar graph paper. Yep. And polar graph paper, instead of, uh, uh, if you think about graph paper where you have a, um, a kind of a grid, it's constant values of X and Y. You can think of those as your lines. Uh, polar graph paper, you have constant values of R and constant values of theta. That's going to correspond to concentric circles around the origin and radial lines. And so uh, on the Spire, I just went ahead and made some graph paper. This is one of the files that Steve and I had been uh, working on recently, just as uh, some uh, help files for uh, calculus. And uh, actually, this would work for pre-calculus, too, if you're looking at polar graphs. Uh, but this little step here is just for showing, uh, helping illustrate to students how you locate a point using polar coordinates. Uh, we've got a little slider here for R. I'm going to decrease R. And let's see, I think that's working. You can see that the R value, and my theta is pi over four. I've got it in both degree and radians. If I change the theta value, it can increment. So there's like pi over three. And by the way, if I decrease, whoops, let me get that onto a nice. You'll notice that those uh, theta values uh, actually increment in finer uh, increments than what these grid lines are. And now I'm going to actually decrease my radius and make it negative. Let's see, hope it'll respond there. Okay, there's R equals zero. That puts us at the origin. And now you can see the negative value is reflected through the origin. So my angle of pi over three would be up at this line here, this radial line, but notice that my because my radius is negative, it's pointing back this way. So that's kind of nice for just illustrating what polar coordinates are like. And if we go to the uh, next page, I think, let's see if I can. Suffering a little lag time here, and I think <laughs> you know, I think this is going to show up here. Um, you can also use this graph paper. Uh, it's kind of digital graph paper, and actually plot then curves on top of it. And so uh, this one is kind of a classic curve. It's just r of theta equals theta, and so that's uh, it's sometimes called the logarithmic spiral. I think. You can correct me on that, Steve, if I've got that misidentified. It <laughs> that looks good. Um, but then we've also then can, we can trace a point around that curve. And it's showing a, an arrow that illustrates both the uh, radius and the angle as you trace around. Okay. So it's just a kind of utility file. Uh, I find that polar graph paper is really helpful when we're uh, introducing students to polar coordinates, and it's kind of nice to be able to graph things on a, a digital version of that.
All right, I'll stop the share and we're probably out of time here, pretty close. That's spot on actually. So well Great. done tonight, guys. Um, well, I, I just, uh, I really appreciate it. This is uh, good information, uh, a lot of good problems tonight, good uh, tech stuff too, that was awesome. Uh, just a heads up, uh, if you uh, want to email me, uh, curtis at ti.com, I will send you a link for one hour of PD uh, certificate. So this was a, a one hour session tonight. Also, I will make sure to get those solutions for tonight's uh, stuff up uh, onto uh, this description here, the YouTube description for this uh, for this link here just below. And um, we have one more session coming up here in two weeks on uh, April 17th. We'll be back here doing the last session uh, of the spring, getting you guys ready for uh, that AP exam here in uh, just about a month. So yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, really exciting. So Anyway, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.